<laughs> I'm Dave Latham, and it's my privilege to welcome Jason Wright back to CFA, because in the summer of 1997, he was an REU intern at SAO when he was an undergrad at BU, graduated from BU in 99, then moved to the West Coast, to Berkeley, uh, got in cahoots with the California Planet Search Team, did his thesis with Jeff Marcy, got that in 2006. Now, both his undergraduate thesis and his PhD thesis had the word magnetic in it. And to some of you, that may be a concern. <laughs> <laughs> but what it tells you is that Jason was already worrying about the effects of magnetic activity in stars on the measurement of radial velocities. Astrophysical effects that would introduce velocity jitter and confound the ability to measure very low amplitude orbital motion. And I think that grew partly from your early interest in long period planets where the amplitudes get smaller and uh, keeping the zero point constant is harder. And then he went off and did three years of postdocs, one extra year at Berkeley and a couple in Ithaca. Uh, but I guess he decided the winters were too hard. And, uh, well, wait a minute. The winters in They're Pennsylvania are pretty bad, bitter, too. Yeah. Went to Penn State as <laughs> faculty uh, <laughs> in 2009 and has been rising up through the ranks. He's an associate professor. You're only an associate professor? I think you right were, uh, yeah, I think you're poised to become. Up. I've uh, submitted my packet. Uh, the package is in. Excellent. <laughs> so even back in the early days, uh, Jason was keeping track of which orbits were good and which orbits maybe weren't so good. And he continues to do that. He maintains the Exoplanet Orbit Database in a website, exoplanets.org. That's not the competition from Europe, which will announce anything. Uh, the uh, Exoplanet Orbit Database is an expert certification of published orbits that can be trusted. And he's uh, turned recently to an interest, well, recent, several years, to an interest in SETI as a valid tool for research in astrobiology. He even has a Scientific American article called NASA Should Start Funding SETI Again. <clears throat> now that resonated with me because I was part of the old NASA SETI that got defunded by Congress in 1994. And you just have to wait for those old fogies to die off and uh, bring back the idea that you might be able to take a shortcut to learning about other civilizations using SETI. Now, to get to the point of uh, today's colloquium, Jason's been interested in doing very precise radial velocity work for many years. He was involved in the very first of the extremely precise radial velocity workshops in um, 2010. Uh, actually, he did all the work. I don't know how you did it all because you were just about to become a father, if I remember that week. And then uh, the third one again in 2017, so I guess it took seven years to recover. And um, uh, he's going to talk today about two state-of-the-art instruments, the Habitable Zone Planet Finder, HPF, and NUID, and um, the prospects for somehow figuring out how to get past the astrophysical hmm. stellar radio velocity jitter. Jason. All right. Thank you, Dave. That lovely introduction. And thanks for inviting me back. It's always back to good to be back uh, in Boston and at the, the CFA and, and see who's around, including a lot of... Uh, uh, I always bump into people I didn't know would be here when I visit, and this, has been, this visit's been no exception. Um, so uh, I used to have a standard plot like this where I explain the radial velocity method, but someone pointed out to me that it's, it's been taught in Astronomy 101 for quite a while now, and so I probably don't need to explain how precise radial velocities work, uh, except that we are trying to measure very small Doppler shifts of the stars due to the orbiting planets and infer lots of things about the planets. Um, and uh, as a result of that, and the way this is often 
discussed in Astronomy 101 is there are many planet discovery methods. Uh, and the, one of the most successful for a long time was precise radial velocities, where we found a lot of these. Um, in fact, I'd say uh, Dave Latham found the very first of those in 1989, by my count. You have the earliest record in exoplanets.org. Um, and, but that since then, the transit method, thanks to Kepler and, uh, and now TESS, uh, has overtaken precise radio velocities as the discovery method. And so one might wonder, um, you know, what the future has in store for precise Doppler work now that we have the obviously superior transit method to discover lots and lots of these planets. So here's a, I, I dug this slide out from uh, 2014 because it it's shows the, the history here, the radial velocity discoveries as a function of time. Uh, and uh, you, you see Dave's very first one there in 1989 and a couple other pre-discoveries and then uh, uh, this, this, fl these floodgates opened and we were finding tens of planets every year by the radial velocity method. And we were very pleased with ourselves for building up this, this menagerie of interesting planets. Um, and then uh, the number discovered by transit uh, eventually started to creep up as the first photometric surveys got the false positive vetting process down and really started to churn these out. Uh, and you can see how Kepler dramatically changed things and we had a big dump with 120 planets all at once. And then as we got better at analyzing Kepler data, uh, it broke my scale in 2014. And so I needed to change my scale with a single release of over 600 planets all at once. Uh, and at the time I made this slide, there were still another 2,800 Kepler candidates waiting to be validated. And today many of them have been. Uh, Kepler's now found thousands of planets. TESS will find many more. Um, and uh, TESS is also opening a lot of new parameter spaces. These are different sorts of planets that we've found before. Um, here you've probably seen a plot like this many times, but the point is that while Kepler predominantly focused on uh, the fainter stars because it was fixed at a single point in the sky, uh, and now K2 has sampled a few more points, TESS will look at the whole sky, look at significantly brighter targets and find many, many more planets. Um, and so, you know, with all of this going on, why do we need uh, radial velocities. And the truth is that precise Doppler work remains a cornerstone of exoplanetary astrophysics uh, and will remain for decades. Uh, and there's several reasons why it continues to be relevant in the era of space-based transit exoplanet discovery by the boatload. Um, one of the most obvious is that if we want to characterize these things, we'd really like to know what their densities are, their bulk compositions. We'd like to know their masses. And except for some cases with transit timing variations, uh, which are wonderful for a few systems, for the most part, if you want to know the mass of a planet, you need to measure the Doppler wobble, the acceleration that the planet imposes on the star due to the planet's mass. So here's a, a plot that's just planet mass versus planet radius uh, on a log, uh, well, I guess it's a log linear scale here. Uh, the color coding isn't particularly important. It's just the stellar flux that each planet receives. Um, but you can see that we have this, this class on the left here of uh, planets that are around Earth size or a few times Earth radius, significantly lower masses than Jupiter. And, and the, the point I want to make is that for most of these, the error bars are enormous. To be on this plot at all, there has to be at least some measurement of the planet's mass. But in some of these cases, the masses measured are consistent with zero when you look at the posterior distributions. Uh, and you see those running off the bottom of this log plot here. Uh, and so if you want to be able to do the same sort of astrophysics we do with giant planets, which, by the way, I think are still very interesting and underappreciated, um, on these more terrestrial planets that TESS is going to discover by the boatload, you still need to measure their masses. And precise Doppler work remains one of the primary ways that we will do that. Um, more so in the past and in the present, but still relevant, is the validation of exoplanets discovered uh, by the transit method. Just because you see a star get a little bit dimmer because a planet passed in front of it, there's a long road to hoe before you can say, yes, this was due to a planet and not due to something else. Um, and so uh, Kepler-62 was one of the first cases where there were roughly terrestrial size, roughly uh, habitable zone planets discovered by Kepler, and precise Doppler work was an important part of the validation of this system. Not necessarily because you can measure the masses of all of these planets with radial velocities, but because it, the lack of radial velocity variation convinces you that you aren't seeing some sort of blend with a background binary star, grazing eclipses. There's a lot of false positives that precise Doppler work helps you, helps you with. 
But it's not just about uh, validating the planets you see. Precise Doppler work also helps us with all of the planets we don't see. Um, if you look at what sorts of planets are typically discovered, uh, this is an old but characteristic plot that gives you a sense before Kepler of the situation. The, this is the semi-major axis of planets discovered by transits versus radial velocities. Uh, transit discoveries are necessarily very close in planets because they have a much higher geometric transit probability. Um, it also takes a very long time to see a planet with a large semi-major axis transit. It doesn't happen very often. And if you require that you see three transits so you know it's periodic, uh, and you'd like to have a few more than that to build up your signal-to-noise, you can see that the transit method will always struggle with long period planets. The um, decrease in radial velocity semi-amplitude with orbital distance, though, is quite weak. It's only to the square root of this orbital separation. Um, and so a lot of radial velocity discovery, especially for giant planets, is not so much limited by our precision long term, although that certainly matters for the lower mass planets. Uh, it's just limited by how long we've looked. And so Dave said I had an early interest in long period planets. Uh, and as you will see, I continue to publish some of those that I started monitoring as a graduate student and have only now come around to the point where we have good enough orbital parameters that I feel comfortable publishing them. Um, and so radial velocities will find these non-transiting planets in these very interesting systems that we're discovering. Um, and so here is uh, one of my favorite examples. Kepler-68 was an interesting pair of uh, transiting planets. This is the, the Kepler light curve on the top, and the, the O's and the crosses indicate the transit events. The crosses are deeper. The O's are in there. You can't really see them. Um, uh, uh, on this very you know, beautiful light curve, uh, the normal sun there for reference on the same scales. So this is a very quiet data set to work with to find these transiting planets. And in the course of follow-up, which included precise Doppler work to measure, to validate these things, uh, the radial velocities showed this wonderful up and down trend uh, over hundreds of days, uh, indicating that there is an exterior massive planet in this system. So this is at least a three-planet system. So this teaches us about architecture. It's one thing to know that you found an interesting low mass planet transiting a star, but just like you wouldn't know everything you wanted to know about Earth if you discovered it, if you didn't know Jupiter was there. Jupiter's very important in terms of Earth's habitability and history. Um, we want to know that what the architecture of these systems is. It tells us both how they formed, but also potentially about their habitability and, and what these planets might be like. Um, and to that end, we have to follow these things for years. We have to just monitor and monitor. So for instance, uh, the, the system HD 187123, uh, here in the lower left, you see this beautiful sinusoidal radial velocity curve. This very nice uh, close-in planet. It's a hot Jupiter orbiting this star. But if you look at the radial velocity time series uh, from 95 to 2015, uh, you see that there's clearly another low frequency signal going on there. Uh, and in the lower right, you see if we phase fold on the orbital period, there's an eccentric giant planet on the outside. And we actually see a lot of these sorts of systems where you have an inner hot Jupiter that at first appears to be on its own, but if you wait long enough, you'll see a giant planet much farther out. I like to say that, that hot Jupiters have cold friends. They like to keep their distance. Uh, that seems to be one mode of planet formation. So um, uh, my uh, undergraduate uh, uh, student, Kat Feng, at Penn State, uh, polished a lot of these off and uh, wrote this nice paper where we sort of presented many of these long period planets that had finally gotten to the point uh, where we could put them into the literature. So this, this shows the value of holding that zero point. We had to separate between pre and post 2004 because we lost the zero point to some degree. Uh, to holding a zero point for many years to really learn about this, these systems. And so precise Doppler work of the past is a legacy that continues to pay dividends on a lot of these systems. Um, these long period planets uh, also hold out the prospect for being direct imaging targets. And so this is just another system of two giant planets around an M dwarf that Kat uh, published. Oh, I should say she's a graduate student at Santa Cruz now, so you should look out for her papers on the archive soon with Jonathan Fortney. Uh, but here are just two more planets around a nearby stellar system. I don't think these two are particularly good necessarily imaging or astrometric targets. Uh, but many of these long period systems are. And so as we start seriously talking about space-based direct imaging and reflected light of giant planets around nearby stars, as we start thinking about what Gaia will be able to do for us in terms of astrometric planet characterization and discovery, it's the legacy of precise Doppler work and the future of it that will be giving us a lot of those important targets that we'll be looking at. 
One particular angle that, that I've always enjoyed and thought hard about as a, as a postdoctoral fellow but never quite worked on it was the point that many um, radial velocity discovered planets uh, will turn out to transit. So HD 209458, the first known transiting planet, was first discovered by radial velocities and then found to transit. And that will continue to happen. And one of my favorite examples here is the, uh, the planet 55 Cancri E. Uh, so 55 Cancri is a long time radial velocity target. It's known to host five planets. Uh, the dynamics of this system are very rich and interesting. Uh, and uh, its uh, innermost planet, 55 Cancri E, it turns out is a transiting object around this very bright star. Uh, and there will certainly be yet more of these found, radio velocity discoveries that will turn out we can measure their radii and do all sorts of stuff with. So um, especially if these are grazing transits, shallow transits, or low or small objects, you might not necessarily notice them in the Kepler, well, or in the, the test data set. Um, but if you know exactly what the phase of that orbit is, then you can go looking for it, and that'll uh, increase your sensitivity to transits because you won't need to see three. You, you, you know exactly what time to go looking. And I was very pleased uh, to see recently on the archive uh, this paper just a few days ago um, by Paul Dalba on uh, the predicted yield of transits of known exoplanets. So what will test the transiting uh, mission uh, exoplanet mission find among the planets we already know about and discover. And their conclusion was that there would be roughly 12. Uh, there's uncertainty only because, uh, both in the inclinations, but some of the orbital phases are not quite precise enough to know that tests will, Kess will catch them. Uh, and that three of them will be novel. So there's two things going on. One, there are three-ish known exoplanets that TESS will measure radii for that are sort of unexpected just due to chance. Uh, but there will also be about 125 RV exoplanets that had the potential to transit, and tests will prove that they do not. So it's an important distinction when we talk about a null detection. There's the null detection where you just weren't good enough to see it, and it might yet be there, perhaps because the signal is strong, less strong than you expected. And there's the null detection where you've ruled it out and you can just stop looking. For instance, the Michelson-Morley experiment to detect the luminiferous ether was completely dispositive. It did not exist. If it had existed, they would have detected it. And so that's what they mean here by talking about a dispositive null detection. So that's 125 planets that don't. We can stop looking. Uh, so the, the, the payoff continues to come from the radial velocity exoplanets. Um, the ones that end up transiting will often be around very bright stars because precise Doppler work requires a lot of photons. And so they almost invariably, uh, the discoveries that come from RV are around targets that are relatively bright. As a result, the RV planets that turn out to transit are often the very best targets for atmospheric spectroscopy. And I was pleased to see this recent paper on the archive uh, talking about what the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to do for a planet like 55 Cancri E discovered by radial velocities. And now perhaps we can learn more, learn more about its atmosphere. Um, so I hope it wasn't too defensive to justify uh, what precise Doppler work will continue to do for the community uh, and for exoplanetary science going into the future. And I think that helps explain why there is so much precise Doppler work that continues to happen in the community and so many new instruments being developed. So Dave mentioned that uh, Penn State has now held two, the, third, the second was in Yale, uh, precise radial velocity workshops. And these have been wonderful opportunities for the teams that are building and thinking about radial velocity instruments and how to analyze their data to get together and, and help each other make better instruments. Um, there are over 26 new Doppler spectrographs that are either uh, being developed or being commissioned right now. And in fact, since this has started, one, at least one has come online and is in full science mode. But at the time, 26 instruments uh, and when we put out the call for this workshop, uh, we invited them all. Please come and, and share your secrets with us. Now, when I was starting out as an as a exoplanetary astronomer, uh, things were extremely competitive. And you did not go to the other team with a meeting and tell them all your secrets about all the great work you were doing. You kept them to yourself so that you would get the planets and they would not. Uh, and the, the, the kids these days just don't get that. I'm glad to say. I'm glad. And these workshops have been, uh, it's really refreshing. We asked everyone to come and um, uh, we said, we want to hear about the nuts and bolts, warts and all, 
and everyone that came to talk about their instruments uh, uh, did that. And I think everybody learned a lot. So we asked everybody to, uh, to give us the specs on their instruments, and I had in imagined I would build a, a chart that I could show in a colloquium and people could marvel at all the things on it, but instead you can just marvel at how much how small I had to make the font so that I could fit it all in. Uh, so 23 instrument teams showed up to discuss things, and you can just see how many new instruments are coming online uh, because there's so much work to do. Uh, oh, and, and uh, we made use of the new research notes of the AAS to, uh, to uh, put this out there and describe how the workshop worked so you can get this, uh, download this table if you're interested in finding exactly which niche a particular instrument is, uh, is unique in. <laughs> Um, so these instruments, the, the precisions, the instrumental precisions that are expected from many of these instruments, they're all below five meters a second. And many of them have things on them that say things like less than 0.3 meters per second, meaning less than 30 centimeters per second instrumental precision. What that means is that we can find lower mass planets because their amplitudes are much lower. So we can find Earth mass planets in the habitable zones, except, as Dave noted, what we're really going to be doing with these is measuring uh, stellar noise. Because these instruments are so precise that we have moved the problem of measuring more precise stellar centers of mass from an instrumental one, that the instrument was flopping around and we just can't measure it well enough, to an astrophysical one, a statistical one, because we're measuring the motions of the surfaces of the stars themselves. And it's hard to tell what's just a photospheric burp or stellar dermatology from a rotating star or suppression of convective blue shift, how to distinguish that from true center of mass motion. So let me, let me give you an example of when my eyes were really open to how bad the problem is going to be. Uh, I mean, I always knew, but this paper really drove it home in a way that I like to put on slides. Uh, and that's the, the claimed planet around Alpha Centauri b. Um, so this is a uh, ostensibly one Earth mass planet around a star that has plenty of photons. And so the HARP spectrograph was able to measure very precise radio velocities at very high cadence. Uh, and there was a major effort to measure, uh, to measure its radio velocities, if possible, on a nightly basis for many years to see what was going on. In the lower left of this four uh, uh, panel plot, you see the radio velocities versus time. And you'll notice the scale is meters per second. And yes, the, you know, the digits go all the way over to 10 centimeters a second of, of, of significance. But you still have to plot it from minus 5 to 10 to capture the range. And you can see that there's a lot going on there. Um, the upper left, by the way, shows the binary motion between the two stars. Uh, so once you subtract that off, because that should be known quite well and is, is, is very low frequency, you're left with this, this noise underneath. Well, I say noise as an exoplanetary astronomer. As a stellar astrophysicist, this beautiful signal <laughs> that's being measured here. So the periodograms are on the right. Uh, the top one shows the long-term activity. Uh, those are the, that's that long-term trend you see. And then once that's removed on the lower plot, you can see the rotational period of the star itself and harmonics thereof. Um, what's going on with the long-term activity, and this is near to my heart, something I did for my thesis, uh, here you have the, uh, uh, the, these are data taken from the same spectra that were used to measure the precise radio velocities. But instead of plotting the radio velocity, uh, I'm plotting the log r prime hk, which is to say the amount of chromospheric emission that alpha sen b was exhibiting at that time of that observation. So this is a measurement just of how much magnetic activity there is because that magnetic activity heats the chromosphere, which then cools through the calcium H and K emission lines, which is what this particular diagnostic measures. And what you see is over this time, it, it, it climbs its way up and peaks and comes down just like the radial velocities do. And that's a stellar magnetic activity cycle, just like the sun's 11 year cycle. And so the star got more active and then started coming down again. And the radial velocities responded. And so we're now at the point where, uh, and it's strange, some stars do this and some do not, which I think is a still unappreciated puzzle. But certainly for Alpha Sen B and the Sun, we see this effect. And then if you zoom in, uh, uh, you can see the star's rotational period as uh, active regions come and go as the star rotates. Uh, and so it's only after <coughs> regressing out all of this activity information from the radial velocities that you can hope to find a signal at the one meter a second or below level and actually make use of these beautiful spectrographs that we're making. So this is a quiet star. This is like, you know, when we go out looking for the best targets, when we go looking for those street lamps to find things under, this is the sort of star we're after. So 
the future of exoplanet discovery at low amplitudes is really the study of surface magnetic activity and other effects as well. Uh, and the number of sources of this uh, radial velocity noise are now very numerous, and a lot of work is being done into understanding and removing them, but also in trying to take advantage of the fact that they don't look exactly like center of mass motions in the spectrum. Statistically, they have differences, and so applying these statistical techniques to dig all of that out. Uh, and I could give multiple talks on all of the different ways that we dig into all of that. But the lesson for this particular talk that I want you to take away is that to even attempt this problem, it required hundreds of observations taken over the spans of a few years. And so if you want to dig these new planets out, you don't just need precision, you need cadence. And so when I think about the future of exoplanet discovery, uh, and characterization with precise Doppler work, I think in terms of a chart like this. So um, I've put three, uh, um, uh, three radial velocity instruments here, the historical Lick survey at the Shane 3 meter and the Kudai Auxiliary Telescope. By Keck, I'm referring to the California Planet Survey with Keck Hi-Rez uh, and HARPS. And those are just to sort of give you reference. There are many more I could have put on here, but I'm, I'm making a more general point. Um, and just in terms of the typical precision that a typical exposure would deliver, and in many cases there were ways to get much lower if you played certain games or integrated in certain ways, but in terms of the long-term survey, at what precision did they operate? Uh, and yes, CAT could certainly get down below a meter a second, and HARP sometimes didn't always do it at quite one meter a second, but this is just roughly speaking. And then roughly speaking in terms of cadence, uh, how many observations were typically being made on a lot of the exoplanet discovery. And so where you would like to live is in the lower right. You want an extremely precise instrument, which is what many of these instruments are, and you want to live far on the right so that you have some hope of digging through all of that beautiful stellar photosphere and chromosphere signal so that you can go find the exoplanetary signal slash noise underneath. Um, and so just for reference, I would put on this notional plot the Alpha Sen B uh, uh, work here. And, and the Alpha Sen BB claim is somewhat controversial. Um, I, I don't have a particular opinion on it. I think it's a beautiful paper and a beautiful piece of work. I'm not sure the planet exists. And when Alpha Sen A and B finally come far enough away from conjunction that we can measure them separately again, uh, I'm sure we'll see if the signal is still there and in phase. Uh, but the point is that you need to be below a meter a second, and you need to be way off to the right here if you want to repeat that experiment. And so I think when we talk about rocky planets and habitable zones, we need to think about how we're going to get there. So the, the future of precise radio velocities that I am in particular most interested in are finding the planets that Kepler and Tess miss, that is the outer non-transiting planets in these very interesting systems. Um, it's measuring the masses and validating uh, the test transits, and that requires very high precision on, on bright stars. Uh, and we'd really like to aim for this sort of holy grail in many ways that's relevant to astrobiology of finding terrestrial planets that might have naked oceans on the surface that we can study. Things in the habitable zones around the nearest stars that give us the most photons where follow-up is really uh, possible. And to do that, we need to do, we need better, we need lots of cadence, we need lots of precision, and as I'm going to argue, it'll really help a lot to move into the infrared. So the three instruments I'm involved in that are going to tackle these from different ways and different parts of that diagram uh, is that I'm going to uh, talk briefly, very briefly, about Project Minerva, which of course has a home here at, at Harvard. Um, I'm going to talk about NUID, which is an important new uh, instrument, community instrument that's being designed for test follow-up. Uh, and I, I hope uh, many people apply for and use to great, uh, to great effect. And I'll talk about the habitable zone planet finder, which will fill in this bottom niche and is already producing good science. So if you want to, if you want to reproduce that Alpha Sen B experiment on a lot of stars, uh, it would really help if you didn't have to share the telescope with people that want to go do other things. Because you need hundreds of observations. So you need at least a share of the telescope almost every single night. So if you wanted to do this, it would really be nice to have a dedicated telescope that you could have all to yourself. The nice part is, it doesn't have to be big. So the Keck telescope did a lot of this early work, but the fact is on bright stars, the aperture is largely wasted. And I remember observing certain naked eye stars, uh, or things like Tau Ceti, which are quite bright. And to avoid going nonlinear on the detector, we would often integrate for, say, 10 seconds. 
And then we'd stop and we'd read out the detectors for over a minute. So we were wasting our aperture. If we'd had a smaller telescope, we could have done the same experiment, collected the same number of photons, uh, you know, on average during that whole thing. Another issue is that one of the dominant sources of noise at short time scales are p-mode oscillations in sun-like stars. On the sun, they're of order a meter a second. They're also last of order five minutes. So you really want to sit on a target for five minutes to make sure that you know where the center of mass is and you're not just measuring a p-mode oscillation. And so again, you don't need a large telescope to sit on a bright star for five minutes to get the photons you need to get a meter a second precision. So that's the overall philosophy behind Project Minerva. Uh, here's John Johnson in, in one of our uh, uh, Akawan, this old picture including Phil Muirhead, and I don't have Rob Wittenmeyer uh, on here. But this is a four telescope array at Mount Hopkins, and the idea is that we get our aperture in four, four off-the-shelf telescopes. So this is low-cost light buckets that are just with fibers feeding our precise spectrograph, which is where most of the effort went into stabilizing the instrument and getting very good radio velocities. So the idea is that because we have this system to ourself, we can live off to the right. Um, and because we're looking at bright stars, we have the photons we need to get down to a meter a second, and because we've fiber stabilized and followed much of the HARP's philosophy, although we're also using iodine, which is novel to our instrument with the foot, well, not novel at all anymore, uh, we, we uh, will be around a meter a second or below. Uh, and if you don't know about this, Jason Eastman here is our project manager and, and wonderfully uh, moving us along on our, uh, on our, our survey. Uh, and so we'd, we'd like to basically live here and be able to reproduce it, and because we own this we have this telescope and it's dedicated to this purpose. We can uh, uh, do this experiment on uh, 80 stars or so and, and have a whole sample of systems like that. And I couldn't resist showing our nice drone footage of the, the fully operational uh, Minerva uh, array, uh, which is operated robotically. Some of us are up there on the left. Uh, and so uh, Minerva is collecting data uh, every clear night. And here in the front is our sibling uh, project Minerva Red, run by Cullen Blake, uh, which is optimized for work uh, in the near infrared, which I'll talk about a bit. We also have another sibling uh, array called Minerva Australis, uh, run by uh, Rob Wittenmeyer at University of Su Southern Queensland. Uh, and the, the point behind this slide is that uh, remote operations will begin in 2019. So that array is essentially is funded, uh, and it's nearly complete. Um, uh, we uh, have three domes on site, Rob does. Uh, we have, actually this is now out of date, 21st November, so domes four and five exist, and we expect telescope five to be delivered in May. So this is a, a nice way to, uh, to lower the cost of the telescope that you need by using off-the-shelf components uh, and focusing on what, what you want, which is the very stable spectrograph. So the, the next instrument I'm going to talk about, uh, you're probably expecting it to live somewhere down here at the bottom, but it actually lives up here. Um, and that's the habitable zone planet finder. And so you look at that and you're like, why is that interesting to live there? And the answer is that it works in red. So this is a bit of a confusogram, but let me walk you through it here. On the y-axis is the temperature of a main sequence star. Uh, on the x-axis is the period of a planet orbiting that star. And these stripes represent two calculations of the habitable zone around that star. And so that's essentially, it's a more complicated, but it's essentially an equilibrium temperature calculation. Or if you like, if the Earth orbited this star at this orbital period, would any part of the Earth have liquid water on its surface? Um, and so uh, you can say what you like about the habitable zone. It's a wonderful target to go after. You know what your science is, and it's an ambitious target. It's difficult to find terrestrial planets in the habitable zone. And so that's why I find it so useful, because it's driving the community uh, to, to really push itself on all fronts. Um, something you'll know about that, notice about the habitable zone is that it moves in. If you are around a cooler campfire, you've got to huddle much closer to stay warm. That lowers your orbital period, and that's where the habitable zone planet finder lives. We're looking for these planets down here. Uh, the uh, Habitable Zone Planet Finder exists. For those on social media, we have a hashtag. Please go to hashtag HPF, which has been written with a laser pointer on the side of our telescope. Suvrith Mahadevan at Penn State is the PI of this instrument, which was built at Penn State uh, and uh, is now at the Hobby Eberly Telescope. So the second advantage to, to going down to these, these low-mass planets, in addition to them having higher periods, is that the signal is much stronger. 
So here's the animation I showed at the beginning with a Earth-like planet going around a star like the sun. Greatly exaggerated center of mass, but it's still within the star. Um, if you move the planet into the habitable zone, then relative to the distance between the star and planet, the center of mass approaches the planet. But then you win again because low mass stars have less of a lever, and so the, have the center of mass again moves towards the planet a little bit more. Uh, and the result is that for the habitable zone, you get about a factor of 10 in the difference in the amplitude of the signal of the same mass planet around the two different stars if they're both in the habitable zone. Which is good because if we're going to measure this at all, uh, we have to go to the infrared, which makes the whole problem much harder. So the reason we have to go to the infrared is because we're not talking about M0, M2 stars, even M3 stars. We'd really like to go down the main sequence, really exploit this mass benefit that comes from getting down to 0 0.2, 0 0.1 solar mass stars. And when you do that, you just lose a lot of optical flux. And so the truly cool M-dwarfs, uh, their spectral energy distribution peaks out at one micron, the near infrared, and that's where you need to be. Um, these, the ratio here between a G2 star peaking in the visible and the M, this is even an M4 star. We haven't even gotten very cool yet. The M4 had to be amplified by a factor of 100 to make this plot. So you can see in the visible, even at M4, you've lost so much flux that even looking at the very closest stars uh, is just not practical uh, once you get past about M4. And so the habitable zone planet finder does just that. It works out here in the near infrared. Uh, here's some early pictures when we were still putting it together. Here's our cryostat. Here's Suvrith with inspecting the shell after delivery to make sure everything's safe. Um, the very top level specs for this thing, it's a YZJ band spectrograph. Its spectral resolution is about 50,000, what you need to do this precise Doppler work. It's temperature stabilized. Um, I like to say the Hollywood pitch version of this particular spectrograph is that it is harps in the near infrared on a 10 meter telescope. Uh, like any good Hollywood pitch, it's a bit of an exaggeration in every way. It will not quite have the radio velocity precision of HARPS because near-infrared detectors are difficult and temperamental. Um, YZJ, the infrared astronomers will complain, isn't near-infrared. It's more like near-optical, and that's fine. Uh, and the HET is about a 9 meter, but that's essentially what's going on. <laughs> it's the illuminated pupil that counts, not the entire size. Um, the Habitable Zone Planet Finder uh, is a blend of uh, heritage and new R&D. Um, it gets a its, its thermal uh, uh, engineering from the Apogee spectrograph, which is a very successful temperature control vacuum spectrograph. Uh, and so it's a very similar design, but now optimized towards stability for precise Doppler work. Um, the optics are at 180 Kelvin, and we can achieve millikelvin thermal control. And so the philosophy here is that you, you stabilize the spectrograph so that you can reliably extract the radial velocities that you measure uh, on the same pixels each time. And what uh, isn't stable, you calibrate using extremely precise uh, calibration sources. In our case, uh, we can use a, uh, an astro comb, a laser frequency comb, to wavelength calibrate anything that is still drifting after all of this careful control. Um, so our long-term RV stability requirement is three meters a second. Um, our goal is one meter a second. And uh, when we have the photons for it, we think we can, we think we can reach this. A lot of, uh, with these detectors, it's extremely challenging to extract a faithful spectrum that's good enough to measure one meter a second RV stability. For reference, that's centroiding a, a, a spectral line to a thousandth of a pixel. And so we need things stable at the one one-thousandth of a pixel. And just getting the photons off the detector with that kind of fidelity is a challenge with these near-infrared near detectors. You can tell I'm a CCD guy. I'm still kind of wary about these infrared detectors. But, but uh, our team has done a great job. We have a nice uh, spectral grasp. And in the infrared, um, we, can, we don't have the advantage of calcium H and K like the Alpha Sen project did. Uh, so we use uh, activity indicators that appear in our spectral band, including the calcium infrared triplet in many of the passion lines. And we've been exploring many more potential lines. We do get the helium 10830 line, which has been very interesting astrophysically. Uh, and so we know that when we explore this new regime in the infrared and in the um, M dwarfs, we're going to encounter whole new kinds of stellar activity, magnetic activity, that just I haven't even seen before. And we're already discovering a lot of that. So the stellar astrophysicist in me is delighted to find all sorts of new stellar signal to sift through. Um, the 
Uh, HPF is on the Hobby Eberly Telescope, which Penn State is a partner in, uh, as, and UT Austin has the, the lion's share of the telescope time, and our co eyes there are uh, happy users of this instrument that we have now uh, delivered. Um, the, I am the chair of the Time Allocation Committee for the Penn State Time at HET, and uh, HE, HPF going on the instrument has made my job much, much harder, as the proposal pressure is now extremely high on this telescope. Uh, so it was delivered and commissioned uh, over the past winter. Shared risk science has been ongoing since May. We now have radio velocities coming in. And full science operations began this month. And so this is a commissioned instrument for the first time measuring precise, I should not say for the first time, that's not true, uh, for the first time for our team, <laughs> getting uh, precise radial velocities on late M dwarfs. And it is working. So one of the hardest challenges is the pipeline development. But uh, this is a few months of observations of a particular M dwarf star. And uh, if you just measure the radial velocities out of the pipe, uh, you get better than three meter per second precision stable over months. Uh, a lot of work goes into this. There's a lot of caveats. I could give a whole talk about it. Uh, but the bottom line is that if you bin things up on a nightly basis, which hopefully in the future we won't have to do the same way, and you look at the median error, we're below a meter a second. So depending on the sorts of signals you're looking for, uh, we're somewhere between one and three meters a second. And there's a lot of room for improvement, both in instrument stability and in the, on the algorithmic side for the spectral extraction. Um, the last instrument that I want to talk about uh, lives in a different part of parameter space. When we talk about finding Earth-like planets, Earth analogs, what have you, um, Earth lives here on this chart in the upper right. Okay? So we're looking at a signal below 10 centimeters per second. So an order of magnitude below the numbers I've been quoting so far. And still a factor of a few below the single measurement precisions of any of the instruments that were at the workshop. Of course, we can get signals that are weaker than a single measurement precision. So in principle, the instruments are stable enough to detect things like Earth around a star like the Sun. Um, but to work over here is very challenging. Um, the instrument I'm involved in, the community instrument that works towards that goal, uh, is NUID, and depending on how you use it and which stars you look at, you can finally start talking about having the sensitivity to reach up uh, all the way up here towards true Earth-like planets. So this is NUID. Um, it originally stood for the, well, it's the NN Explore Exoplanet Investigations with Doctor Spectroscopy is our little backronym. Uh, NN Explore is the NASA NSF program to uh, explore exoplanets. Uh, NUID has the, the funny pronunciation, uh, rhymes, it's like fluid, easy to remember. Uh, and the reason we chose it is that it's a nod to the Tohono O'odham, the indigenous people uh, at the, the land around Kitt Peak National Observatory. And it's a word that we've borrowed from their language that means to see, which we thought was a nice, uh, a nice word to use for, for the telescope, uh, for, for the instrument. Uh, so here's a snapshot of the, the team the last time we had a big group photo. This is Suvrath Mahadevan, third from uh, the left over here. Uh, our PI, Fred Hardy, our project manager all the way on the left. I am the project scientist. Colin Blake at Penn State is doing uh, a lot of the work on the detector and characterizing and mounting that. Christian Swab, second from the left there, did the optical design. And we, uh, Scott Diddams and Ryan Terrian are working on the laser frequency comb. It's going to be a laser astro comb stabilized instrument. Michael McElwain uh, is leading the effort on the port to interact with the telescope. One thing I've learned is that when trying something like this, getting well below a meter a second, um, is in terms of the instrument, there's no tallest tent pole any longer. Once you've stabilized thing at things at the level that these instruments are stabilized, thermally and atmospherically, What's left is just a lot, a lot of grass, and you have to mow the grass if you want the quadrature sum of all of those terms to be much less than a meter a second. And so driving the design of NUID, uh, and I think this is really pioneering stuff, uh, Sam Halverson published in 2016, the error budget, is a real comprehensive error budget. And there's stuff that you just won't know till you get to the telescope, and you have to carry a lot of risk for. So each of these is a known source of noise that we know, or instability, that we know we're going to have. And all of them have to add up in quadrature to stay under our error budget. And we targeted 30 centimeters a second. That's what we have to hit, instrumental precision. 
uh, and the current best guess is that we're going to get to 27. And we know some of these will be larger than we thought. We hope some of them will retire to be lower than we thought. But the number of terms here and the sizes of them, all of these things are below 10 centimeters a second. In fact, the, the only one here that's double digits, the only two, uh, the reduction algorithms themselves are one of our tallest tent poles. And another is uh, the inability to perfectly correct for the Earth's atmosphere and scattered sunlight that come in. These are our dominant sources of noise we expect. So this helped really drive the design and it gives every team member a goal, like you can't go above this line. And so I've been responsible for things like the, um, the barycentric correction algorithms, for instance, and making sure those are better. Uh, I don't exceed my allocation of one centimeter a second on that. Um, so one of the things that we did for NUID uh, was keep the design simple. Uh, and so you'll recognize this slide looks a lot like the habitable zone planet finder. Uh, we really wanted to uh, replicate as much of that heritage as possible uh, because we learned a lot of lessons from that and you know you don't want to learn more lessons than you have to in this business. Um, so uh, it, it inherits the HPF vacuum chamber design. Uh, it's operated at 300 Kelvin. Something interesting I learned is that it's easier to keep something slightly warmer, precisely warm than precisely cold. And so it runs slightly above the temperature of the room that it sits in. Because we're not in the infrared, we don't have to be cool. Um, and we are achieving the temperature stability uh, that, that we require. Uh, we're within a millikelvin uh, in terms of our temperature stability. So nothing's changing inside the spectrograph uh, in all of our thermal tests, which has been an enormous effort uh, led by Fred Hurdy. And uh, it's, really, it's really gratifying to see it all come together and see a truly stable instrument. Cullen Blake uh, is working on the detector. This is an enormous beast of a CCD. Uh, it's 9K by 9K, which is 90 millimeters on a side for your detector. Um, it has 16 readout channels. It's monolithic. One of the things we have to worry about, just to give you a sense of how difficult this is, when you read out a CCD, you're pushing electrons through semiconductors. So you're dissipating heat. So it's warming up. And your thermal control doesn't like that because you've created a heat source inside of your spectrograph. The CCD itself will get warm and expand. And so your wavelength solution changes underneath you as you read out. And so you have to wait for it to go back before you take your next exposure. I made someone calculate the heat deposited by the starlight. Unfortunately, we have to worry about it. Um, if, you, uh, if you just run the CCD, you get a huge 5, 10 millikelvin temperature change uh, in the system, measured in a particular way that's confusing. But the point is that there's a big change. And Colin has led a, a, a whole effort to characterize so-called dithered CCD clocking, a new way to clock and read out the CCD, and you have dummy registers going all the time and so on. It's all very complicated, but the bottom line is that we can, we can mellow out many of these changes. So this is the level of stuff we worry about when designing NUID. Um, one of the challenges, if we're going to inherit the HPF design, was to fit inside the box uh, the room we're in is extremely small, and we didn't think it was possible, but we figured out how to fit the, doer, the, the cryostat or the, the vacuum chamber in the room. The challenge was fitting all of the optics in the vacuum chamber. Uh, we have a prism for reasons I'll get to in a moment. Uh, and we did manage to put it all together. At one point, we actually had the CCD underneath the shell because it was the only place left to put it. Uh, we had to fit inside a 2.4 by 1 meter box and fit the entire spectrograph in there. And Christian Schwab uh, led the optimization and all of the choices of various things that go into an optical design that gave us the, uh, the whole train that we need to make this spectrograph really work. The reason for the prism is spectral grasp. If you use a grating for a cross disperser, uh, you only get one octave of light because the second order or neighboring, the second order on the cross disperser starts interfering with the first order. So you can either go to two arms or you can uh, have a prism which doesn't have that two to one problem. And the reason for that is that our spectral grasp we wanted, we needed for this work to go all the way down to the calcium H and K lines so that we have those important chromospheric indicators. But we also stretch all the way red out beyond the calcium infrared triplet. So we wanted every possible indicator of stellar magnetic activity that we could get, which makes the stellar astrophysicist to me extremely happy. Uh, and so this will be a wonderfully broad grasp uh, spectrograph for the community to use. So the big punchline with NUID is that this is not our spectrograph, although of course we feel very attached to it. This is your spectrograph. Uh, this is a public instrument. It's going to be on the wind three meter at Kitt Peak. 
uh, a 3.5 meter telescope. The partners in WIN are Wisconsin, Indiana. Penn State is now a partner, so we get to use it. Uh, but also, NOAO, of course, has a large share. Uh, and through the NN Explore program, that time will be made available uh, through NOAO and through NASA. Uh, and so if you're doing exoplanet science, for instance, test follow-up, uh, this is an instrument that we and NASA want you to use to do that, that follow-up. Um, uh, we know that you can't ask for half a night or one night of time on a telescope and discover an exoplanet or validate it, unless you just need one spectrum. You need to be able to take, in, take data over a long time to follow the entire orbital phase. So uh, NOAO is implementing Q-based observing at the WIN for this purpose. Now, the other WIN instruments will still be classically scheduled, but new it will be Q-scheduled. So you will be able to request time by the hour. And if you need 30 minutes of time, you can ask for it. If you need 2.76 days you can ask, or nights, you can ask for it. Um, and, uh, and you can ask for whatever cadence you like. It will be on the telescope about half the time. So you can essentially request any cadence you like. If you want Rossiter McLaughlin measurements, you can have it for you know, eight hours at a time or something. And if you just want one shot a night for 100 nights out of the year, that's also something you'll be able to request on a semesterly basis, of course. Um, also, part of the NUID package is 24-hour turnaround. I think it's 24. If Chad Bender's watching, he might be yelling at me right now. But it's quick, quick turnaround time on the rate, rate of velocities. So the product you get, yes, you'll get the spectra, but you'll also get precise Doppler measurements with error bars. As a result, so you don't have to be an expert spectroscopist to get your RVs. Uh, and the first proposals are due for 2019B. Well, they're not due yet, but they should be due sometime, I'm guessing, in April. Uh, and things are on track for that to be the case. And so this is a real thing that's happening very soon. So um, in this space as I imagine it, these are the three instruments I'm interested in and where they fill the space HPF in red because it's a rather unique niche. Uh, and I'm confident that it will move down and also uh, it's a heavily subscribed instrument. And so provided we keep the number of targets we look at small, it'll also move to the right a bit. Uh, but the planets it finds are around a different class of stars, so very interesting. Um, I wanted to close with a couple of slides that are aimed at students in the room and advisors of students in the room, but also anyone that wants to learn more about the statistical techniques that are used here and in other parts of astronomy and the large data sets that are coming through. Many of you know that Penn State hosts the Center for Astrostatistics uh, for over 10 years, almost 15 years now. Uh, we've offered a summer school in statistics for astronomers, which is how a lot of people have learned the latest Bayesian techniques and other statistical techniques. Um, this is taught by statisticians and astronomers together, uh, and so you really will learn the latest techniques that are being uh, used in all of these papers in a rigorous formal curriculum. We've also, last, just this last summer, added a summer school in astroinformatics to help capture all of the things you can do with high performance computing and big data. Uh, and so these are offered uh, back to back. I'm sure they'll be offered again. So keep an eye out for those. And please come to Penn State and learn these methods uh, from our experts. Um, if you're thinking about graduate school or a postdoc, uh, we have the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds. This is an umbrella center that encompasses everything from solar system, asteroids, and, 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 and the Earth and uh, planetary science, all the way to exoplanets and nearby stars and the way that those stars interact with their planets. It's a very broad mandate. Many people here maybe have been to our seminar. We have a seminar every week. Um, and uh, we have a lot of opportunities for postdoctoral fellows to come and work with people and be interdisciplinary about all of this. It goes beyond even that. Penn State uh, is a many-time node of the NASA Astrobiology Institute, our Astrobiology Research Center. Uh, we just had uh, a new node renewed. Uh, uh, at Penn State, so we're once again part of the network. And because that's there, uh, we offer an astrobiology PhD at Penn State. We're one of the few places that do this. Uh, it does say College of Earth and Mineral Sciences up here, but this is a dual title degree. So someone earning any degree at Penn State in a related discipline, including astronomy and astrophysics, can take extra courses, do extra field work. Yes, our students really do go spelunking and find extremophiles in caves. Uh, they can earn a, a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics and astrobiology, and many of our PhD students do this. It's a very popular option. Um, and new to uh, just this last year, as part of the astrobiology dual title, one of the courses we took, which I pioneered last, is a course in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which we consider part of astrobiology. 
Um, this is our class last year. It was a very popular course, Visiting Green Bank, where we worked with Breakthrough Listen to conduct radio SETI observations. But the point of the course was not just to do radio astronomy. It was to create a real curriculum in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence as a part of astrobiology. So this was one part of it. The students all had to do final projects that made major contributions or serious contributions to the field. Uh, and if you're interested in our curriculum or the papers we read, which are forming the canon or what their projects were, you can go to our website and, uh, and do that. So this is now part of our astrobiology curriculum. It's a formally numbered course now at Penn State. I think that's the first anywhere. And finally, uh, if you are or advise an underrepresented undergraduate who's interested in any STEM graduate program, please let them know about our STEM open house. Every fall, Penn State's graduate school invites uh, students to apply to come visit Penn State to learn about the graduate program. We pay transportation, we pay room and board, you visit whatever department you want, you talk to whatever professors you want, you learn about the program. Um, it's a lot of fun to talk to the students that come through, so please encourage uh, underrepresented undergraduates to apply to this program. Okay, enough salesmanship, thanks. And thank you for leaving time for questions. I fight that terribly long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I just talk with best. Okay, Jen, first. Uh, hi, lovely talk. Thank really you. exciting to see all the progress that New is making. With the idea of proposals being due in the relatively near future, um, is there? Do you anticipate there being an exposure time calculator yes. that we'll be able to use? Absolutely, okay. exposure time calculator. Wonderful. Has to exist. It must exist. Therefore, okay. available. I'm sure. Good deal. Yeah. Um, and do you have thoughts on how well, target duplication will work? Because I imagine for people wanting to do test follow up, there will be a lot of there will be test planets, oh, but they man. might have the some number of telecoms we've had on this topic. Okay. Yeah. Um, Apply for the science you want to do. Uh, I hesitate to speak for NOA or NASA. My personal opinion is target duplication is a problem for the TAC to worry about, just like it is with any other expert. Okay. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> cool, thank you. Saji? Uh, HPF uh, goes all the way to 1.5 or 1.5? No, not 1.5, it's just J-band. It doesn't go to H-band. Okay. Um, in a sense, and that's one of the things that Carl Menes, who's a similar instrument, they claim, they said that it was kind of a mistake and they should have cut it at 1.1. Stick with CCDs, not worry about a... Oh, CCDs. Uh, CCD works... Yeah, they do. They go out there. No, I, I agree. You can, you can stretch so, it. So, I don't know if they, that was the uh, impression from the first set of data. Do you actually have the same impression or...? No. I think we're very happy with that. I think HPF, after much you know pain and difficulties with any development, um, I think we're very happy with it. Is that I've never heard anyone on the team say, "Gosh, I wish we had a CCD," other than me. But <laughs> I don't know any better. They don't let me in the lab. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's also a question about the near infrared. Um, so, the, to measure velocities, you need to worry correction, and you also need templates. Correction. And, and the templates are very bad in near infrared. So what do you do about this? So we're using cross correlation techniques, uh, much like uh, Harps does, uh, which involves. Uh, so one of the ways we can measure abstract rate of velocities is something like a digital mask, where you pick individual lines. So you don't need a true pixel by pixel template. Um, the so remember we're not at sub meter second levels here. We're at one to three meter a second levels, where Harps, for instance, is already pretty well proven. Telurics are a huge problem. Unfortunately, we have Chad Bender on our team who knows how to, who has written TerraSpec and knows how to drive all these radio transfer codes that calculate uh, the telluric regions. And um, uh, he could come and talk for a whole colloquium on how we deal with that. The bottom line is that the, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. And we're getting, we're hitting our targets, and it was all part of the design. So yeah, it's, it's, we've, it's very hard, and we've, we've, we feel like we've tackled templates. Is a big problem. Uh, templates is a problem in the near infrared in a couple ways. One is that if you try to observe a star to determine its spectrum, you're looking through the Earth's atmosphere, which is filled with absorption and emission. Uh, the second is that M dwarfs have very rich spectra. You can't make assumptions like, oh, there are regions of continuum because there are many regions, perhaps most, in m dwarfs where there is no continuum. And that, that makes regularization of, of uh, deconvolution a lot more difficult. So there's a lot of problems in the infrared with that. 
Uh, I think the bottom line is that because we're we're not we're not in the same regime as in the optical pushing way below a meter a second, that it's it's working. <laughs> uh, but I agree; th these are all challenges at this level. Oh, well, let's start with Charles. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Minerva is exceptional in that it's built. It came with telescopes on spectrograph. I think everything else you're talking about is the, an existing telescope for which a spectrograph is added. That's right. Yeah. At what point do you just fly the bullet and say, we should just build an entire system from the ground up? We shouldn't be including this, Including the telescope. Including the telescope. Or so is it only going to be at the bottom? There's, the, the, yeah, so the question is, do we, at what point do we need to build the whole telescope in addition to the instrument to achieve this stability? Um, there's a few answers. One is, having seen how difficult it is to couple a spectrograph to a telescope, I'd say we've done a lot of work on the telescope. <laughs> so the port and, and I mean, the requirements of holding the star on the fiber are exquisite and very difficult to achieve. And we're really struggling with how to acquire the star and hold it in enough time that it doesn't take five minutes per target or something like that. So I'd say we are, in a lot of sense, building a lot of the components. I'm not, I don't think I see a lot of advantage necessarily to building an entire telescope from scratch. Um, the other thing is that I feel like on the instrumental side, we're measuring the stellar activity extremely well now. And the big temple now is the stars themselves. So I don't know. That's what I would say. The biggest advantage of building the telescope for the instrument is you keep all those people off it that want to look at faint fuzzies. <laughs> exactly. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's the real advantage from an Minerva. All right, let's go over here and then go over there. Yeah. So I've, I've heard some instrument teams talk about using single mode fibers to reduce. Mm -hmm. Oh, single mode fibers are a tantalizing option. Justin Kraft is doing this at Notre Dame. Yeah. Do you have any opinions on that? I think you... single mode fibers behind on, on a diffraction limited telescope are an amazing opportunity because no matter how large your telescope aperture, your spectrograph is this big. And there, there's amazing opportunities, I think, for ELTs there and for space-based uh, spectrographs there. Uh, I've talked to Justin. I've seen his talks, uh, for instance, at the Precise Rate of Velocity Workshop. Single mode fiber is very hard to work with. It's hard to get to efficiently couple them to the sky because it has to be a diffraction of the telescope. Uh, and it's also, I mean, these are tiny, tiny images that they make on your detector. And so you have a lot of, a lot of novel challenges. And so. I'm very pleased that Justin is working so hard to bring that up to the level where we can start talking about that as a mature technology. I'm excited about it. Okay, Erwin, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I guess you might as well. More to the other side. On Newton, yeah. your major source of error is the atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere? Yeah. That's what you said. Uh, the the telluric lines in the atmosphere, we have budgeted, yeah, at 10 centimeters a second. I'm hopeful it won't be that bad. So these are the um, very weak, often uncatalogued water lines that you would not normally see in a high-resolution spectrum because they're so small. They're very hard to pick out. But we know many are there just from line lists. And we know others are not in the line lists because we see them. And we know there's lots in between. So this is a problem Sharon Wong has worked really hard on. Two potential suggestions. Oh, wonderful! I want to hear your suggestions. One was whether you could calibrate them with laser reflections from the upper atmosphere. Oh. Or two, whether your instrument <laughs> was portable no, he's taken outside and you the could box. take it to a higher altitude. So the water <laughs> column varies. So I think we naturally see variation, but going to a higher or drier site would definitely yeah, minimize like the, the South Pole, for example. <laughs> <laughs> That's the <laughs> South <laughs> South Stream. But <laughs> why <laughs> may not be so extreme. These are, I, my, I, we have a lot to talk about, David. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say about the lasers. I'm so intrigued. <laughs> uh, Thank you. take one more question. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Reluctantly. Uh, you, you, in, early in your talk, you mentioned the importance of getting information about uh, planets in larger radii orbits. Oh yes, uh, and uh, long period planets. You know, I'm I'm not an expert in this field, but I've I've often thought that the best approach, and this is actually a question drawing on your expertise, would be 
uh, direct imaging in the mid infrared. In the mid infrared, in the mid -infrared where uh, uh, the contrast ratio with yep. the star is much more, is four orders of magnitude more favorable. And you might actually pick up the thermal emission from the planets exactly. rather than the reflected light of the planets. Absolutely. So there have been several planets and substellar objects uh, discovered with the latest generation of direct imaging instruments like GPI and Sphere. And they predominantly target young stars for exactly the reason you mentioned. These are working at near infrared wavelengths. And so if you have a star less than about a billion years old, then a gas giant, Jupiter mass or larger, is detectable pretty easily with these instruments. As you point out, the problem is not getting photons from the planet. It's distinguishing them from the glare of the star. And that's now being done with these, these new uh, extreme adaptive optics instruments. Uh, and so I agree. Those targets are terrible radial velocity targets, though. Right. And so it's usually either or uh, when it comes to those things. But definitely looking for younger, looking for emission from young planets is something people think very hard about. Well, thank you again. Great for